Good morning, BookTube. Bill Rutenberg here with the Rutenberg Library. Wanted to show you some new books that I got. Uh, we had kind of a surprise outing, a couple surprise outings this last weekend, and um, we were out and about doing some last minute uh, Christmas shopping, trying to get that all finished up just in case, uh, you know, stores start getting shut down. Uh, I know that uh, some of you have alluded to that, and, and we're in the same same boat and so uh, as we were out uh, I, I of course was looking for books and on Saturday we had ended up going to uh, the Dollar Tree looking for a couple little items before we went over to Wally World and and gave them some of my paycheck and of course as I was digging through the shelves I found a couple nonfiction books that looked you know interesting um, so in my collection, I have got a couple of different books uh, about, um, I'll call them wandering adventures. So like uh, I've got, I think it's called A Walk Across America, book one, and A Walk Across America, book two. And um, is it Peter Jenkins, I think maybe the author's name. Don't quote me on that, but I think that's the author's name. Um, I read both of those books and I thoroughly enjoyed them. I thought they were very interesting. Um, they're books that I could go back to, you know, later on, and um, I just I really enjoyed them. I've also got his book Walk Across China, which I haven't got to yet. I hope to, uh, but it looks very interesting. And I've also got a book um, upstairs called Dove, and this was a Robin Graham was the author, and he was a young boy in the in the um, Vietnam era and he w sailed around the world by himself and he was a teenager you know he he um, what was he 16 17 years old I can't remember he was a teenager and he sailed around the world all by himself and uh, he ends up meeting his wife down in the uh, down in the South Pacific in the islands and they end up getting married and stuff so I read his book Dove and then I read his, his other book, and I'm not going to remember the title, but he ends up building a house out in the out in the boonies with his wife, and they live kind of off the grid, and that was very interesting. So I so long story short, I like those type of books. I have I have found that I I enjoy them. I don't know that I want to build a huge collection around uh, those type of books, but I do like them. And uh, as I was digging through the shelves at the Dollar Tree, I found the man who walked backward. An American Dreamer's Search for Meaning in the Great Depression by uh, Ben Montgomery. And so I saw this and I got to looking at it and I thought, you know, that might be pretty interesting. That might be kind of like those other those other books. So um, I did start this, didn't get very far, a few pages before I went to bed one night. But um, I want to read the front cover to you and hopefully you think it sounds interesting too. So it says, the true story of a Texas man who, at the height of the Great Depression, set out to walk backward around the world. Plenty Wingo was hit hard by the Great Depression. When the bank took his small restaurant in Abilene, he found himself penniless with nowhere left to turn. After months of struggling to feed his family on pitiful wages, earned flipping pancakes and scrambling eggs at a greasy spoon, Wingo decided it was time to do something extraordinary, something to resurrect the spirit of adventure and optimism that he and perhaps the whole country had lost. He decided to walk around the world backward. In The Man Who Walked Backward, Pulitzer Prize finalist Ben Montgomery charts Wingo's backward trek across the, across the America that gave rise to Charles Lindbergh, Al Capone, and the New Deal. With the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression as a backdrop, Montgomery follows Wingo across the Atlantic, through Germany, Turkey, and beyond, and describes the daring physical feats, grueling hardships, and comical misadventures and hostile foreign police he encountered along the way. A remarkable and quirky slice of Americana, the man who walked backward paints a rich and vibrant portrait of a jaw-dropping period of history. And so, uh, you know, I just thought that sounded sounded interesting, and I uh, thought I'd maybe go on the adventure with them. So there's the author right there, Ben Montgomery. So that was one book I picked up. The other book that I picked up at the Dollar Tree, for a dollar, of course, um, was The Most Memorable Games in Giants History. 
The Oral History of a Legendary Team by Jim Baker and Bernard M. Corbett. And of course, you know, if you follow the channel, you know I like my my sports uh, biographies and stuff. So I thought this would go good, go well with the with the uh, sports collection. So um, relive and debate the most glorious and significant moments in New York Giants history. The images are indelible. David uh, Tyree crashing to the ground with the football somehow secured against his helmet. Y.A. Tittle battling the vaunted Bears defense. Backup quarterback Jeff Hosteller replacing an injured Phil Simms to lead Big Blue to the championship. And that is when I started watching football was that very that particular Super Bowl. So that was kind of the reason I bought this. Um, so anyway, these legendary moments have been memorialized in highlight reels and photographs, but they represent only a small part of the highs and lows of the Giants' 85-year history. With extensive reporting and engrossing storytelling, Jim Baker and Bernard M. Corbett bring to life the scenes of one of the NFL's most successful and popular franchises. Finding the people who lived these moments, Baker and Corbett put us behind closed doors in the commissioner's office in 1946, prior to a championship game made suspect by a fix attempt. In the swirling snow with Pat Summerall as the Giants fought to stay alive in the 1958 playoff hunt. And in the huddle with Eli Manning as he diagrammed the play that would result in the deciding touchdown of Super Bowl, and I think it's 42, with an eye for memorable details and histor historical significance Baker and Corbett let the players themselves tell the war stories that all Giants fans love to relive, and in so doing, construct an engrossing and exciting history of the team and the sport. So I thought that would be a fun uh, read, and it's done in little chunks, you know, with different teams and different games. So it'd be, you know, something I could I could read a little bit, put it down, and then come back to it at another time. Not something I necessarily have to read all at one time. Um, and then the next three I got yesterday, uh, yesterday on Sunday, uh, my, my wife had, uh, went to St. Joe to do a little bit of, uh, the last, the last bit of the Christmas shopping and, uh, why they were in St. Joe, her and my daughter brought me home a surprise and they brought me home three books dealing with civil war stuff. And so I was very, very, uh, happy with that, uh. Uh, while my three-year-old and I stayed home, they were out, like I said, shopping. And so this was a nice little end-of-the-day present that they got me. So the first book uh, is Touched with Fire, Five Presidents in the Civil War Battles That Made Them by James M. Perry. And so it's kind of a cool cover, too. And this is, let's see, let me get you a publisher here. This is a public affairs publisher out of New York and it is a 2003 book and uh, this is this is what your inside cover says on this one um, in our let's see in our youth our hearts were touched with fire so said Oliver Wendell Holmes jr. the future Supreme Court justice about his fellow veterans of the Civil War the 1860s were a time much like the 1940s when a generation of idealistic young Americans answered their country's call and made the supreme sacrifice to preserve freedom and liberty for all. And among the two million boys in blue were five soldiers whose wartime heroic, heroics would take them into national politics, a ride that would lead in time to the White House. In Touched with Fire, James M. Perry reintroduces us to these five men, Ulysses S. Grant, Rutherford B. Hay, Rutherford B. Ruddy Hayes, James A. Jamie Garfield, Benjamin Little Ben Harrison, and William Mac McKinley, men who, with the exception of Grant, we dimly remember. This is the story they wanted told. What mattered most to them was that they had participated in terrible, bloody events that had saved the Union. Perry describes how Grant won undying fame at Fort Donelson and how that victory sent him indescribably on his way, oh, excuse me, inexor inexorably on his way to the White House. Garfield was a bit of a rogue, a fascinating, devious, and brilliant man. 
he conducted his own victorious campaign in the mountains of eastern Kentucky and went on to play a major role in events leading up to Chickamauga. Hayes, a good and decent man, fought in more than a dozen major battles and was wounded four times, once seriously. McKinley was just 18 when he enlisted in the Army, but he saw much active duty in Hayes' regiment. Harrison took part in Sherman's celebrated and vilified March to the Sea and distinguished himself a number of times. So drawing on diaries, letters, and other first-hand accounts, Perry recreates the battles that brought these men fame and extols the courage that made them extraordinary leaders, especially under fire. The Civil War was their finest hour, and touched with fire, sheds new light on these Gilded Age presidents and makes for a vivid reminder of what a truly great generation can accomplish. And so there's uh, James M. Perry there. You can kind of see him. And then, I believe, yeah, we had some pictures on the mid in the middle of this. And so, you know, we got some, some famous pictures and maybe some that you're not familiar with. And so there's black and whites in the middle of this. And Anyway, I like this book. I really like the cover. I think the cover is cool. Um, but uh, that's going to be a good one, I think. Uh, and these, all three of these books are books that I had had on my radar and I told my wife about. And uh, so that was nice that she remembered and went and picked them up. Um, the next one is Partners in Command. The Relationships Between Leaders in the Civil War by Joseph T. Glad Gladhar, Gladhar, Gladhar. I don't know if I'm saying that right. I apologize. There's that, and this is from the Free Press out of New York, and it is a 1994 book. But even though it's a 1994 book, if you look at that. Everything is sharp. There's no bent corners or anything like that. I mean, got a little mark there, but um, that's not a big deal to me. So let me share you the share with you the inside cover here. So again, this is partners in command. So this is uh, Sherman, Grant, Jackson, Lee, and all the great commanders of the Civil War remain a source of enduring fascination. But although their individual personalities and strategies are well known, the truth is that no commander fights alone. And an essential determinant of victory in any large-scale conflict is effective collaboration among the high-ranking military commanders and between those leaders and their civil, civilian superiors. This was especially true in the Civil War, where compatibility and communication among commanders spelled the difference between victory and defeat for the Union. While the South had its share of successful partnerships, the intense conflict and mistrust among the Confederate leaders contributed heavily to their ultimate defeat. Now prize-winning historian Joseph T. Glatthauer takes us into a battlefield tents in the halls of government to look closely at several of these critical relationships on both sides of the conflict and assess their impact on the outcome of the Civil War. The most productive relationships of the Civil War was the friendship between the silent and unrelenting Grant and the gruff and charismatic Sherman. Their contrasting personalities balanced each other, while their agreement on strategy led to victory in the first in the West and later in the East. When these men linked up with their ribald and innovative Admiral David Dixon Porter, another powerful bond was forged. Early in the war, the Confederates had a, a potent team, and Robert E. Lee and his skillful executor, executor uh, Stonewall Jackson. But ultimately, the fate of the Confederacy was sealed by such unrealized partnerships as that between Jefferson Davis and Joseph E. Johnston, a general who could not live up to his president's expectations. While Lincoln was exasperated by a similar struggle with the unassertive General George B. McClellan, he redeemed this failed relationship through his successful collaboration with Grant. Gladhauer goes behind the public facades of these great leaders to show how they work together under the pressure of war. He demonstrates that the strength of their command relationships 
uh, was decisive in their victories and defeats in steering the war in it to its inevitable conclusion. In so doing, he adds a new dimension to our understanding of how war is fought and victory is secured. All right, and so that sounded like a you know very interesting. I, I like listening to the to the um, you know the stories of the high command and how they work together or didn't work together depending on the situation. This has got a couple maps throughout. Um, so like this is the Vicksburg area map. And so it's got some of those throughout the book. Uh, there's not a bunch of them, but there's a few. And all three of these Civil War books are right around 300 pages. Two of them are just under and one of them's just over. So they average out about 300 pages. So nice quick reads. Um, the last book here that I've got for you is Intimate Strategies of the Civil War, Military Commanders and Their Wives. This is edited by Carol K. Blesser and Leslie J. Gordon. And thought this was kind of neat. It's always interesting. You know, if you're married, you know how uh, the partnership determines a lot in what goes on. And, and so I always think this is kind of interesting to see uh, partnerships between commanders and their wives. Um, and this has got several uh, uh, blurbs on the back. Gary Gallagher's one of them, Gene Baker, uh, Catherine Clinton. Um, so anyway, had some good blurbs. A couple of these others did too. Um, this one comes out to Intimate Strategies of the Civil War, Military Commanders and Their Wives. From Robert E. and Mary Lee to Ulysses S., and Julia Grant, Intimate Strategies of the Civil War examines the marriages of 12 prominent military commanders, highlighting the impact wives had on their husbands' careers. Carol Blesser and Leslie Gordon assemble an impressive array of leading scholars to explore the marriages of six Confederate and six Union commanders. Contributors reveal that for many of these men, the matrimonial bond was the most important relationship in their lives one that shaped and was shaped by their military experience. In some cases, the commander's spouses proved relentless and skillful promoters of their husband's careers. Jesse Fremont drew on all of her connections as the daughter of former Senator Thomas Hart Benton to aid her modestly talented husband, John. Others bolstered their military spouses in less direct ways. For example, Ulysses S. Grant's relationship with Julia, a Southerner and former slave owner herself, kept him anchored in stormy times. Here, too, are tense and temptuous pairings, such as William Tecumseh Sherman and his wife Ellen, his foster sister before becoming his wife. And Jefferson Davis's fascinatingly complex bond with Verena, further complicated by the hostile rumors about the two in Richmond society. Throughout these, historians paint remarkably intimate portraits of their subjects, ranging from hints of sexual passion to the wives to the wives' fierce protectiveness of their husbands' reputations, to the surprisingly frequent visits of spouses to the front lines and battlefields. Readers will see these famed men in a way that they perhaps never considered, not merely as famous leaders, but as lovers, husbands, and fathers, illuminating a frequently neglected but extremely significant side of military history Intimate Strategies is a must-read for anyone seeking a fresh perspective on some of the war's best-known commanders and landmark contribution to Civil War history. So that'll be, I think, uh, you know, I think it'll be a really good read. Uh, I forgot to tell you, this one's from Oxford University Press, and it's out of, or it's from 2001. Um, I really, so like here's, here's some here. Yeah. So anyway, this will be this will be a good one. I I think uh, it'll be very interesting. So I hope you've enjoyed this uh, this little small book haul. Only five books, but uh, I thought they were pretty good. Uh, I hope everyone's having a good time, staying safe, and uh, enjoying their reading. So until next time, BookTube. Happy reading.